I took working organizational psychology, I was told that the best spot for any kind of presentation, if you want people to agree with you, is just after lunch because they won't have any fighting. Just be digesting. And um, so I have the pleasure and privilege of welcoming back to Denmark uh, Professor Reed Stevens, who is a professor in uh, the learning sciences at Northwestern University, Department of Education and Social Policy. Um, and when his, his name showed up on the uh, in the program, one of my friends called me and he congratulated me on getting read because he said every team, every conversation needs to have a really cranky ethnographer present. <laughs> um, and I tend to agree because I was lucky enough to spend some time with Reed at Northwestern University when I was a grad student. And Reed really taught me that very often when you study phenomena like play, learning, all these kind of things that kind of can to tend to interchange the stuff that we think we know what is but uh, really only know what it is when we see it and when we get into the materials. It's usually not what you think. That's the main thing that I took away from my time with Reed. It's usually not where you think, where you think or what you think. Um, so we asked him to come back and talk about the work that he does on games and play in the context of education. All right, well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And I'll try to live up to my reputation as a cranky ethnographer. <laughs> So um, I'm going to talk about a particular study I've done, but a variety of studies I do generally. Um, and what I call these are field studies of cognition and learning. The diagram you see there is one that I created a number of years ago um, as part of the leadership of a science of learning center in the United States called the LIFE Center. And LIFE stands for learning in informal and formal environments. And my mission in the center was largely to argue for the value of studying learning in places other than schools. And what this diagram represents is if you do, if you add up all the time um, people throughout their lives spend in formal subjects, this takes out recess and lunch and those sorts of things, that's the percentage of a year. And what you see from that, even in the time where that, even in the range of life when that's the highest between and this is all US-based, so it would be probably different in different European countries. Um, the most amount of time that anyone spends in those formal subjects is 18.5%. This, this diagram helps us see that there's a sea of blue where we should be studying learning just as actively as we have in schools. In my field, the learning sciences and other fields related to it, cognitive science, uh, educational psychology have put the lion's share of its effort, at least until recently, into studying learning in schools. So this was meant to disrupt that. And that's the kind of work that I've done largely over the last 10-15 um, years. Um, just a, a point on that, um, I've imposed upon this graph a percentage. Does anyone want to guess what 47.7% of time spent for young people in that age is? compared to 18 and a half in academic subjects? Me too. Screen time. Time, if you broaden it, the time that kids spend with electronic media. It's almost half their waking hours. So arguably, then, we should be paying as much attention to that as the cultural curriculum as we are to the school subjects. So the way I've done my work um, over the last 25 years is I'm for some people all over the place, but I'm pursuing certain kinds of problems that come up in different places. So what I've done is taken some screenshots from some of the many field sites I've been in. You see some of them land in the orange, so those are in school or formal settings, but many of them land outside the orange. And I think in about 25 years of this kind of field work, I've been in 18 different field sites. And so what I'm trying to do is build a theory of learning that's relevant across these sites. So here's my approach, and this is what I'm going to try to exemplify today. Um, I see it happening in four phases. The first phase, as a kind of a basic learning scientist, is I like to go out and find important context to study, especially in formal contexts, and try to understand what the interactional and organizational features of those settings are. So not in all cases, but in the case I'll illustrate today, sometimes I draw from a study and try to take those productive features that we've identified in informal settings and adapt them to a different kind of design learning environment. And so the story I'll tell you today 
is about a study of video gaming that we, and actually this conference has been really great for me to reflect more on what features we actually extracted from that study and took into a design learning environment called Fuse Studios that will, I think, resonate with a lot of things we heard this morning about how to generate playfulness in, an, in a learning environment. Um, the third phase is we implement these environments with partner schools, and then we go back and do more ethnographic work about what happens when we've implemented this new arrangement. Um, I think when Ben was talking earlier, he made a comment. He, um, he said, well, everyone knows schools are what learning is about. Actually, one of my mentors and someone who this program of work I'm describing to you takes inspiration from is this character here, Howard Becker. And Howard Becker wrote a, a very influential paper for me that sort of sets some of the conceptual logic for what I do. And in 1972, he wrote a provocative paper called A School is a Lousy Place to Learn Anything. And I'm going to read the opening bit of Becker's paper to you to get to the setup of why it relates to what I'm talking about here. So Becker writes right at the outset of this paper, um, institutions create myths to explain to their participants what they do, how they do it, why society, needs, why society needs it to be done, and how successful they are. Every institution fails in some measure to do, do the job it promises, and its functionaries find it necessary to explain both that they're trying to do better, that the disparity between promise and performance does not exist, is not serious, or occurs only rarely. So here's the logic of the work, both of which have played out in things I've done. Institutional apologias divert our attention from the very organization of from the very way an organization of institution produces its failures. So arguably, some organizations actually are set up to produce failure. If you've read work like uh, Varen and McDermott's Successful Failure, they've made that argument about American schools. But this is the important point for what I'm doing here. Further, Becker writes, they divert us from the comparisons which might show how others, under a different name and rhetoric, actually performs the institution's characteristic function more effectively. What's Becker saying here? He's saying, go look elsewhere to see what organizations are actually producing learning effectively, whether it's called the school or not. And so that's what took me on a journey out into the sea of blue over many years and trying to figure out what features of learning were productive and successful regardless of whether it was called a learning environment or not. So now let me turn to the study I'm going to tell you about that's relevant to what we're doing here today. Um, I have studied games and play a little bit more games than play, but I'm going, to, I'm going to bridge on those two ideas later, and I think we've already started talking about them a little bit here. There's sort of three criteria that lead me to do the studies I do. First, as an ethnographer and someone interested in children, my main criteria is the things I'm studying are of interest to children. Um, I think I might broaden it a little when Mara was talking about serious topics. I also am interested in things that we would call concerns for children, but for the purposes of this talk, I'll just sort of stick in the area of interest. The second is, at the very same time, it's a source of contra controversy in adult society, meaning, as we know, for people who've thought about games, there's raging controversies about whether video games are good for you or bad for you, good for your learning or bad for you. So, and then the third criteria, given that I'm an ethnographer, there's a lot of correlational studies, for example, about video games and their negative or positive effects, but they're rarely studied ethnographically. And the study I'm going to share with you was, in some ways, the first somewhat agnostic study about just going and studying video games in kids' homes. Um, what kinds of insights can ethnographic gaming studies provide? First of all, as a learning scientist, I just want to be able to look in other places and learn about things like cognition, embodied experience, collaboration, learning, identity. But then I want to go further and see if we can leverage those insights into the design of new experiences. So here's the study I'm going to tell you about. And I'm going to spend a bit of time digging into this study. And then I'm going to bridge into how we took the insights from that study into a new learning environment that we created and that we think embodies many of the things that people in this room are interested in. So this was a study that was um, a sort of summary paper was published in 2008, nearly a decade ago. Um, and I've continued to work on the material and probably will have a book coming out about this and some other media next year. Um, what we did was pretty simple. We wanted to know 
what kids do and what they learn when they play their own chosen video games in their own homes in their normal situations. Now, getting that set up is not easy, as, as you would suspect, but we managed to do that, so we studied teens and tweens doing that. Um, we, the main data, which are, you're going to see some examples of here, were video recordings that synchronized what was going on in the room with what was going on in the game. There had been studies in the past of just what was going on in the game, but for an ethnographer, at least a lot of the actions between the people, right? So we set it up to be able to capture both kinds of those interactions, and in addition to the primary techniques, uh, my specialization is something called interaction analysis that comes out of conversation analysis. Um, but we also did interviews and asked the participants to do various kinds of self-documentation. So now let me just jump into some of the findings. And I've selected some of the findings here to shape the things we bridged into the learning environment. I'll talk about it in a few minutes. So one of the findings of this study can be put this way. Committed interest within a peer culture and freedom to self-organize and collaborative play led to what we've called diverse learning arrangements in which young people productively learn and teach together. So I'm going to show you an example of this. And what you're going to see are these two boys playing together. And one of the boys is going to notice that another boy has figured out a move. And in the midst of them trying to do something collaboratively, they're going to shift out, and it's going to be a small teaching and learning moment. And then that will sort of expire, and then they'll go back to the collaborative gameplay. I have a little tricky thing here with the cursor, so I'm trying to get it. OK. <laughs> we saw kids together figure these things out. And what's the point here? The point is, without none of them are professional video game teachers. They didn't go to video game teacher education school. But somehow, across this vast set of studies, kids figured out how together to learn. So I'm going to take you through five other examples really quickly, just to let you see how various they are. So in the top frame, you see Rachel. And Rachel was trying to subvert the game. She was playing something called Zoo Tycoon. And instead of trying to run it as a business, she was trying to find the cheat codes and do other things so she could trap humans in her zoo. I don't know why Rachel wanted to do that, but that was her thing. Her brother was a more experienced player. So he would be in a nearby room. And when she needed help, she'd call him in as a just-in-time guide. And he'd come, he'd get the help, out he'd go. That was one example. Another brother-sister pair was different. In this case, the brother, again, was the more experienced player. He's in the foreground of this image, while his sister is in the background. And in this case, she just liked to hang around while he was playing. And so what would happen is she would open up um, game guides and other things on the web and just feed him sort of as a continuous stream of ideas, things he might use. Largely, he didn't register them. But once in a while, he would take them. So this was their rather unusual learning arrangement. 
Here's two from a particular family that had two brothers and a younger sister. Um, in this first frame, you've got the two brothers playing different games on different systems, and at certain points, they would switch games, and they were effectively cross-training. Where did they come up with this? I don't know, but that's what they did. One of my favorites comes from them when the two brothers, or the older brothers, and the more experienced gamers were playing in the foreground. Their younger sister was in the back, but she wanted to learn the game, but they, there was limited screen time, right? So what would they do to get her into the game? Um, if you know Laven Wenger's idea of legitimate peripheral participation, this was a physical instantiation of it, where the two boys would be in the foreground playing the game, but then they'd get to a boring part of the game. And in the boring part of the game, they'd pause the game just like you saw the guy in the first frame. Then they'd bring the sister in from the periphery. And they'd let her do the boring part. But for her, it wasn't the boring part because she was now getting to play the game and do challenges. So they'd let her get right up to the precipice of the next level, pause the game again, and she'd go back to the periphery. And so through that process, she would get a lot of experience. The final example, and these are just five of, I think we ended up in a study um, of 30 different things that we called different learning arrangements. This, these two boys had really interesting ways of working together. The boy on the left was the more expert player and the boy on the right. And there were various times when the boy on the left would literally put his hands over the other kid's hands on the active controller and show him how to do a move. Sometimes that didn't work, so he came up with this interesting moment, one of my favorites, is he took a, a dead, a broken controller, and he took it, and he got up here in the line of sight of his friend while he was playing. And so his friend is trying to do the moves, and he's got it in his muscle memory, right? So he's doing the moves in his line of sight. Those are just five examples. And again, the point of this is that here's an environment, a culture, that kids care about. They want to learn games. So they find ways to teach and learn together. And that's what we mean by learning arrangements. OK, so now I'm going to go to a second finding of this study. And one of the things we were trying to do is sometimes we think of games as sort of this separate world. And what we were finding in this study is something quite different. I'm going to use Vanessa's case, a 12-year-old girl in the study, to give you an example of how this is different. Video games were so central to these kids is they were tangled up in so many aspects of their lives. And I've listed just some of them, and I'll illustrate them in a moment. So tangled up in family life and family history, in identity differentiation with parents, in relationship with friends, in positions on gender, in projected futures for adult jobs, in moral lessons she would take or not take. All of this was happening in relation to the gameplay. So a couple illustrations. Here's Vanessa at some point saying to the researcher, who was a grad student of mine at the time, we've been playing video games since I was three. My dad taught us how to play. It's been like a family thing for years, except for my mom. She doesn't like to play. There was a lot for Vanessa about differentiating her stance and her interests from her dad's in particular. Um, she says about her dad, he likes those army games and all those boring, you know, your dad? Yeah, he likes the boring. I say his games are boring. He only likes, the only games he likes is the army and sports. I don't like those games. And so she goes on to talk about how she likes different kinds of games. I'll show you a quote in a second. Games were a context for having distinction among friends. Here's a quote from Vanessa talking to the researcher again. Actually, I never told my friend about the website. And this was one that had all kinds of tips and cheat codes. She was kind of withholding this information for herself. And the researcher said, you haven't? No, not yet. You just tell them all the stuff you, yeah, they actually wonder why, how do I know all this stuff? So she's sort of gaining status among her friends by withholding this information. So for her, there were games that reflected her gender identity. Here in the bottom quote, she's talking about a game that she played because she got it cheap off the rack at a video game store called Bratz. And she says, I don't know why I played it. It was some girly game that I found on the rack. And they didn't have any other games to rent. And I played most of all the games they had in there. So I tried to be open-minded. It was about fashion, makeup, and you know, the whole girl thing. So video games are a place to take a stance on gender. Um, it was a place to take a stance on what she wants to do in life. 
Uh, the only thing you do is shoot people. This is again referring to her father's interest in shooting games. Um, or in the sports games, or just pass the ball. That's the only thing. Long pause. I mean, I enjoy shooting other things, but <laughs> constantly trying to fight for something. Plus, I never want to be in the military anyway. I'd rather stick to science or something. So she's seeing the gameplay as a way to reflect her own identity as a person. And then the final example of, I'll show here is Vanessa taking a moral lesson from her very favorite game, which was called Kingdom of Hearts, Kingdom Hearts at the time. And she took the lesson that you stick with your friends. Because the overall narrative arc of this game involves a storyline where two characters effectively break up early in the game, have a disagreement, and they come back together for mutual benefit in the game. And she takes from that game this lesson about how to proceed in her everyday life. So those are two of the findings of this study. And now I'm going to share a third with an illustration. Um, one of the things we absolutely found in this, not unlike the story about the learning arrangements, is how remarkably inventive kids were in figuring out problems and the really interesting resources they would draw on. And this is one of my favorite illustrations of that. What you're about to see, the two frame, gameplay on the left, uh, sister, older sister, more experienced player, uh, younger brother, not much of a player. She's playing a Harry Potter game on the computer here. And so what you're going to see is her playing along through the game, and she's going to make some requests of him. So listen for the requests she makes, listen to what he does, and just follow this first frame, this first video here. Tara, sing me something, please. What? Please sing me something. I don't know. Tiny Tim song? I don't really care. I had a little turtle. His name was Tiny Tim. I put him in the bathroom. I see a pink of linen. He drank up on the water. He ate up all the salt. He tried to eat the bathtub, but it wouldn't get down his throat. I was thinking. He made me and a fire in the morning. Everybody hear what she said there? Okay, you can stop now. Anyone get a sense of where she stopped him? After she solved the challenge, right? Okay, it's cute. Maybe that's not so interesting. We, we decided it was interesting. So here's the next um, bit further on in this very same uh, sequence. He's getting ready to leave. Sing the song again, Tyler. <laughs> Sing the song again. Back he comes. <laughs> seriously as a way to understand the kinds of resources kids will assemble when they really want to do something. Does anyone who knows games know what's missing from this environment? The game's sound is missing. And where did the game's sound go? She turned it off. Uh, you need a little ethnographic backstory, which we, we generated. She turned the sound off because in this game, I don't know, I don't know Harry Potter well enough to know 
but in the game there are these slugs or snails that make an awful slurping noise, <laughs> and she has a, a personal deep fear of slugs and snails. Mm -hmm. So she had to literally turn off the sound of the game because it disabled her play. So what did she replace as the soundtrack? <laughs> her brother singing. So that seems... Couldn't you interpret that she likes to be together with people? She's it, scared of being alone? And it, it, it could be, but the, the, the structure of the that's evidence... The to keep him. I mean, yeah, possibly. One time he wasn't there, when my researcher was there, she thought about playing the game, she got into the game, and she said, now I need my brother to come sing this song. So we've argued seriously that this is part of her cognitive system. If you know Ed Hutchins' notion of distributed cognition, we honestly believe she made him part of her cognitive system for solving these problems. That's one of the really remarkable ways, and it's just one example of the inventive ways that kids solve problems. So the takeaway for me from this, and I don't think I'm, I think I'm preaching to the choir here, is that kids have more resources for both teaching and learning from each other and solving problems than we thought. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about leveraging now. So shifting here, I just gave you a bit of an overview of this gaming study. Um, now I'm going to move into the second part where I'm going to tell you how we took the ideas that we, the findings we, and the insights we got from that study, and with, with some other input for sure, but how it was pretty determinative for a project that I started back in 2012 um, and has grown significantly here into 2017. And most of the ways we've organized that experience come from insights from that study. And then, so I'm going to talk about two. One is how we adapted it and then how we're actually then going back and doing subsequent ethnographic studies about what's happening in this new environment. So um, Ben's discussion of the paradoxes of play versus school sets up this slide nicely. Um, I talk about infrastructures for learning in schools, um, sort of those pervasive connected elements. These are some of those elements. You know, in, in normal schooling, at least in the US, and I think um, largely in Europe as well. Teachers are, and curricular materials are positioned as experts. Kids are the ones who receive instruction. They ask for help. That's the asymmetric relationship in classrooms. Student work is mostly individualized. An assessment is individualized. The economy of school runs on things called grades, and grades are generated by tests and those kinds of things. A um, couple implications of that normal infrastructure. One is that kids are often de-incentivized. Like in this room, if I told you some of you are going to get A's and some are going to get B's and some are going to get C's, now help each other with whatever the task is, I've de-incentivized you to help each other, right? So there are discourses that are very common in American schools about cheating and copying and doing one's own work. So that's one implication. Students are de-incentivized in regular classrooms for helping each other because of that normal infrastructure. And there's an underutilization of the knowledge in the room. So the question is, could we do something about that? Um, I've wanted to see bigger changes in education um, throughout my career. That's, I think, why I got into this. Um, here's the theoretical argument in a nutshell in three points and what the real challenge to innovation in education seems to me to be. Um, Jean Lave and Ray McDermott have argued that the materials and associated practices of the entrenched educational infrastructure, which I just shared with you, disengage, disengages and alienates students, and he, they mean this in a Marxist way, um, from learning. Um, I did not do that. I might have done it with this. Um, Infrastructures are difficult to change piecemeal because of their inertia and their interconnectedness. So you have grades and you have curriculum and they're all tied together. Therefore, it's hard to sustain innovative learning environments in school because you can try to insert something new, but the broader infrastructure is going to kind of swallow it up eventually. So this has been my analysis of why things are challenging. Yet, I wanted to try something new and in 2012, we created a project called Fuse Studios. Um, a, a, 
the gentleman in the back who made the comment about a kind of a Marxist critique of education, I am with you 100%. Um, we, to cut to the chase on some of this, over four years, um, this model has found its way into very normal American schools at a scale of about 130 schools. And currently, there's about 16 to 17,000 kids doing this on a weekly basis. So you don't know what it is yet. I'm about to show you a video about what it is. But in my mind, it was designed out of the best features that we took away from the gaming study and other features of informal learning environments. So without further ado, this is a video we had a documentary filmmaker make. Of course, it's a bit of a kind of a, it's not ethnographic in the sense that it doesn't show the, the warts and stuff. It sort of shows the better parts of Fuse, but it does give you an illustration. And it does give you an illustration in the context of teachers and kids' own words. And then I'll elaborate on that. I never heard of anything like this before. And I was like, oh my gosh, you really get to do this? It was really fun. Nothing's impossible in Fuse. Fuse is a new approach to learning developed by researchers and educators at Northwestern University that allows students to follow their interests and tackle STEAM challenges at their own pace. And yes, <laughs> have fun doing it. My favorite thing is to be in the Fuse lab even before the class comes in, because as they come in, the buzz starts. Here's how it works. Students choose. The students have all of these challenges to choose from. They get to then pick what interests them the most, what types of problems they're most concerned with, and then learn at their own pace, at their own rate, and learn something that truly interests them. The fact that you get to choose what you do, you get to learn by yourself, and you're not just learning out of a book. It's more of an open environment. There are dozens of challenges available. My favorite challenge is Dream Home Gut Rehab. TJ Customizer. The 3D Laser Defender. Selfie Sticker. Get in the game. Push the wall. And these challenges are actually tough. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it spills important 21st century skills such as creativity, adaptive problem solving, and the willingness to fail but persist. In Fuse, failure is just another try. In Fuse, there is no right or wrong. It's just if you fail, pick yourself back up and just continue. And if there's something you want to do, go for it. And if it doesn't work out, oh well, tweak something and try again. Fuse engages and motivates students using the idea of leveling up just like in video games. The kids get the video game model. They work with it and they like it. It all jives right with where they're at. Once students get engaged, challenges level up, getting harder, requiring them to build on knowledge and skills from previous levels. It starts them off really slow with a very simple level one challenge where they have to do something kind of basic, where they learn how to use the software, and then it gradually increases to make it more intricate in terms of design and process. As you might imagine, a few studio requires a different approach to teaching. It's more about facilitating, asking questions, helping students think and do for themselves. Unlike a uh, traditional classroom where usually the teacher is the, the instructor giving out all the information and fuse, I kind of just guide them through the process of design thinking and through the challenges. My relationship with students has changed as a result of fuse. I have learned just as much from the kids as they've learned from me. A unique thing about Fuse is the culture that develops in the classroom. Because each student works on challenges in a different order, they develop unique expertise that they want to share with others. They help each other and truly learn from each other. There are absolutely students who emerge as leaders. Some are leaders in problem solving. Some are leaders in being cheerleaders for other students. Others are leaders when they aren't leaders in other subjects or socially, and they get to be the person people come to when they need help or advice. I see these students becoming leaders, becoming instructors, turning around and helping other kids regardless of their age level, their functional level, taking ownership of whatever challenge they find engaging and helping others through it. That's what I see every single time I run that studio. This is where students who never thought of themselves as good at engineering, science, or programming find a fascination that can be life-changing. I've never really seen myself in like a future in math or science, but as I'm in Fuse, it's like I'm starting to 3D print or I'm building my dream home, and it's like I could actually do this. It's not boring. It's something that's actually fun. In the Fuse class, I realized that I'm more intelligent than I've actually given myself credit for. I learned that I, I love technology. Now because of Fuse, I actually feel like being um, 
an astronomer, an engineer, an astronaut, an architect. This is where your future begins. You're not really teaching kids some specific, narrow piece of content that exists in isolation. You're teaching them how to learn, how to investigate, how to cope with failure, how to manage success and dovetail that into your next project. These are skills that will serve them well no matter what job, what field, what sort of life experiences they have. It's amazing to see what the kids can do. And I'm surprised every day when we're in there. And they just, the students love going to Fuse every day. So that's an overview of the elements of Fuse. And now I'm going to articulate the very explicit ways that we and I, um, I'm the creator of this project, took from the game study and adapted those ideas into what Fuse is about. So obviously it models the core experience of video games that level up. We've created these challenges that level up. Um, it, the word choice came up a lot this morning, and I think importantly it came up. Um, we've provided curated choice. Students can choose what challenges to, to start with and navigate, but choice um, runs throughout the whole project, not just choice about what challenges do. They can stop and start when they want. They can follow a pathway through challenges that's entirely their own. They can work alone or with others. And these are all being implemented in normal American public schools. And it's a unique thing in relation to the rest of what's going on in school. But I, we can talk a little bit about why schools seem to be going for this. Um, and I'll give you an honest uh, perspective. When we got this started, we were doing it in out-of-school settings like local libraries in the Chicago area. And I was pessimistic um, because of studying learning outside of schools. And someone made that distinction early this morning. But we gave it a try, and we were surprised. And we formed a really nice partnership with a school district that led to this growing expansion. Um, we've tried to incentivize rather than disincentivize things. I also heard this morning about creativity and taking risks and failure not being failure. Failure, as you like, kind of, if we have a motto, Failure is just another try, right? Um, we've tried to create a peer culture that's similar to what we found among that friend and family culture with those diverse learning arrangements, an idea I'll pick up again in a second. And that main point that came out of that gaming study is that we really wanted to trust the insight we saw when kids are motivated and interested in something like they are in gaming. If we could make them motivated and interested in this, all those same resources of helping each other and figuring things out, even to the point of using your little brother as the soundtrack for your gameplay, could be leveraged and brought into play. So um, with support from the National Science Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, um, we've also been doing research. And now I'm going to show you some of that research, some of which reflected in the video. Um, broadly ethnographic methods, uh, video recordings largely as data, but other kinds of ethnographic video data. Um, and I'm calling out this one particular thing. Kids wore visor cameras to give us a first-person perspective. If you can imagine a few studio, I'm going to show you one in motion in a minute. You saw one in the video. You can't put a fixed camera in a fixed place and get a chance to follow a line of activity. So we had to put the cameras on the kids. Um, so one of the findings here is absolutely resonant with what we found in the gaming study, which was given this choice and this environment, kids create a huge diversity of learning arrangements, different ways they work and learn together. So examples include independent work, no surprise there, joint work of various kinds, parallel collaboration where two kids are working on a challenge but doing their own thing, exchanging information side by side, kind of a constant peer guidance, similar to those things we saw in the video game study, where the brother or the sister was feeding the other kids. Um, saw a lot of that. And sort of brief peer guidance. Again, resonant with what we saw in the game. Hey, come over and help me. Quick help. OK, you can go away now. Back they go to the work. Um, so here's a dynamic view of these learning arrangements. We did an analysis of one of the rooms and we were in the room at the time, and where you see a box or circle go around a pair of kids, that's sort of one different learning arrangement. A couple kids working together in a certain way, um, three kids working together there. Um, that's kind of the brief consultation model. Um, and you'll see a lot of them 
kids mostly choose to work together in FUSE, and there's no disincentive to work together. In fact, there's a possibly slight incentive because that's the way we train the teachers to encourage them to do that. But if you don't want to work with others, you can work alone. And here, there's four kids working alone substantively throughout the experience. And some kids work alone for some challenges and work together on others. So this environment produced that same effect of these diverse learning arrangements. The second finding, which was um, foreshadowed in the video, is something we call relative expertise. And relative expertise is the idea that within one of those classrooms, within one of those studios, we use the notion of studio to kind of be suggestive about a different image. What happens is that kids do different challenges at different paces, and they get good at stuff. I'm going to give you an illustration. And then they become recognized as the relative expert, not the absolute societal expert in 3D printer or something. But for the sake of that room and that community, they are the experts. And there's a ton of good things that come out of that. So here's an example of Carmen, who developed relative expertise in 3D printing. Uh, we did an analysis of how she got there. Um, it more or less followed a, a, a description of informal learning you get from someone like Barbara Rogoff. Um, it began with her just getting interested and paying attention to people using the 3D printer other than her. Then she started hanging around the printer, observing it, its function, and paying close attention to it. Then the teacher, who was sort of leading with the control of the printer, she started helping him, apprentice-like, right? Then he recognized what was going on there, so he started offering her kind of guidance. It was a scaffolding sort of move, help her learn to do it himself. He went on paternity leave. She was sort of left as the expert in the room. She jumped into that void and started doing the maintenance and the control of the 3D printer herself. She moved on to help and teach others. Eventually, she, sh the teacher gave over the whole control of the 3D printer to her, not only showing other kids how to use it, but maintaining the print queue. And so she became a very important kid in this classroom, because if you use a 3D printer, you know it takes a long time to 3D print. And if you want to get in the queue, you had to, you had to get with Carmen. <laughs> so not only did that learning happen, her relative expertise was recognized by everyone. It was recognized by her. Um, here she says, I'm like the master of the printer now. Uh, she was recognized widely by the kids in the room, and importantly by her teacher. And uh, echoing something, uh, a lot of the video that you saw was generated talking to the, um, the documentary filmmaker about things that we had found. And here he says, and you know in regular academic class, he was sort of a regular academic teacher, she might not always show that confidence. Uh, you know, she likes to participate, but you can tell with her answers sometimes there's not that confidence. Whereas here at Fuse, when it came to 3D printing, Carmen could tell you with confidence this and that and the other thing. So the point is that she was recognized as having this. This is a phenomenon we see in almost all the studios. Whether it's about 3D printing or another kind of skill or another kind of tool, this kind of relative expertise develops. So what are the good things about relative expertise? Um, one, it's empowering for students in a school to be known for being good at something among their peers. Um, often, it's students who aren't the high achieving students who have that distinction. And that means a lot to them. Um, we see social networks expanding because if I need to know how to use a 3D printer and I'm in this friendship click, and you're in this other one, I'm still going to go across to your friendship network because you know this and I'm going to ask you about it. Students really learn to be open to help and feedback in this environment. Um, and they learn to seek out knowledge in places other than where they're supposed to find it, like in textbooks and in teachers. And they, they learn to find it where it is in the room. And so much more of the know-how in the room gets used. Um, here's a video of a young woman being interviewed by one of my graduate students, Peter. Um, she's going to start by telling you how when she started Fuse, she wasn't good or interested in computers at all. Um, then she's going to talk about the experience of becoming the relative expert without using those words, obviously. And right in the middle of the interview, a kid is going by and calls upon her help, and she calls that out. So just watch for that.
I used to suck at doing any computer technology, and now today people are asking me right now, uh, DT, can you help me with this? DT, DT, can you help me? See, right now, right now. <laughs> yeah, and that now, right now, people need my help, right now, and it just makes me feel good about myself. It makes me feel glad that I'm with you, and it makes me feel like I that views can like I can change views, and views can change me. That's why I feel like right now. So, um, some of you might be thinking, um, the couple examples I gave were of girls who were doing, playing this role. Um, there's sort of at least stereotypes about helping behavior among girls. Uh, a really good question might be, does that um, take them out of doing their own activities and learning the challenges? We've done that analysis with all of the kids in, this is 15,000 kids. Um, this is um, a comparison of girls and boys completing levels. Um, and as you can see, um, there's no statistical difference. And in fact, on the, when the girls and the boys get up to the higher levels, the girls are actually completing them at an equal or higher level than the boys. So at least in the aggregate, this doesn't seem to be. And, and there's, there's cognitive science literature that tells us that teaching is a good way to understand something more deeply. Um, so, the, the, where I want to end is this is largely framed within aspects of a gaming study that where we borrowed the structure of gaming and borrowed aspects of the community and the peer structure of gaming interactions. But I, I was inspired by the, the focus of play here. Um, we, we loosely say play, right, when we talk about video game play. But as it's been talked about here and about playfulness, I haven't seen it as much in the I, I haven't been thinking about it in those terms. So I've been drawing since um, getting ready to come here on a, a distinction from a paper I like quite a bit. In particular, there's two pieces here, but uh, Thomas Malby back in 2007 was sort of pulling games and play apart in an interesting way. And largely, he and a friend of mine, Constance Steinkuller, have been conceptualizing games with these partially bounded activity systems with rules with emergent properties that are realized in play. Whereas Malaby and Ian Bogost in a recent book are arguing, and I think that was reflected in some of the stuff we saw this morning, to think play or playfulness is better construed as a mode of experience. In Bogost's book, he says you can talk, you can play anything. Um, so Drawing on that distinction, I've arrived at a new hypothesis for why Fuse works so well for kids, and then I'm going to illustrate it and then finish up. The game structure, as the teacher in the video said, does really appeal to kids. The challenges, the choice, and the leveling up, and the whole peer culture sharing thing that happens in game cultures. But I think Fuse also allows for playfulness in a way that is very uncommon, at least in American schools. And so, I wanted to show you, um, as an exercise in this, I asked, that's Kay Ramey, she finished her dissertation on this, is now working a postdoc on the project. Um, I said to two of, and, and another student, I said, grab a couple examples of what you think would be playful from data you've looked at recently. Just an ordinary example. So I'm gonna show you those two ordinary examples. This is a girl sitting with a friend in that sort of peer consulting role. Um, doing the dream home challenge. So and what I've written on the right is a call out to something that I think represents playfulness here. What should this be? Hmm. A lounge. Lounge. What kind of lounge? What does a lounge look like? Like somewhere that has everything for anyone. Like, I'll just make a foosball table. Oh, relaxing. Table, but it's floating. I will. No, no, no. My my house is in the future, so everything's floating. Yeah, it will. So there's a foosball table. There's a bit of imagination in the future. My house will be in the future, so everything's floating. And she went on to make more things floating. 
A second example from Dream Home, one of the features I think about playfulness is going beyond what's assigned, what's the rule. And here's an example. What you see right there, and it'll be on the screen for about five, six, seven seconds, is one girl's finished Dream Home. But one of the things we've seen throughout, and again, a kind of ubiquitous phenomenon in Fuse, is these these challenges are just starting points for kids to elaborate and explore further. So what you're going to see is that's what's required by the challenge. And what you're going to see as the camera begins to move is everything that was not assigned by the challenge that she created. So. That's the challenge, that's the exploration. And then the final example, and it resonates, um, Ben, in our discussion of playfulness, uh, gave his active ingredient as having to do with taking sort of jokes and nonsense seriously. You're going to see two forms of playfulness in this example of two boys doing a challenge called Coaster Boss. It involves rubber tubing and balls and making the ball do certain kinds of things and go certain speeds, and you'll get a sense of what it involves. Uh, the boys both do the challenge and go beyond the challenge to create playful alternatives to what their coaster does. But you're also going to see a frame of play socially. And what you're going to hear is in this classroom, the teacher has drawn on the sort of design thinking idiom of sort of IDEO fame. And he's pretty heavy handed about it. He thinks it's an important thing to layer into this experience. And the kids here are playing with and playing off and sort of mocking some of that language while at the same time is, in, in a sense, actually achieving what it is, and it's around the concept of ideate. Um, so take a look at this as a possible other example. So we made, like, it's kind of like an accurate roller coaster. Sounds like really cool. So it's going to be pretty much impossible to do. Sounds like it's going to be really cool. Yeah, 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 it's going to be really cool. We can try and make like a funnel so he has a big area. What's going on with the helmets? Uh, safety. <laughs> <laughs> uh, safety, I would say. I mean, maybe the boss will have to make sure the ideas get flown too much. <laughs> 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 you can look at that. Safety, make sure you close it every time. You should have video We have a video. Oh, oh, you saw that? You saw that? It's amazing. Are we documenting? What are we documenting? I Make prototypes. Right, this is great. come on. How about go? Innovation. That's exciting. I did I did. I did I did. Let me see my vision. So what I take as meaningful from that is that, but like those are, those are, yeah, those are um, almost done. One more slide. Um, those are, that's pretty powerful for a teenager, a good identity positions to be able to occupy. I'm doing it, but I'm keeping some distance by mocking it and mocking the IDA things, playing around with the notion of safety in their coasters, and then he plays off that again to say it's keeping the ideas in the head, avoiding explosions. What I most want to get you is the vibe of that. That's, pr that's pretty much what Fuse Studios are like. And it's that kind of relationship you saw between the teacher. Now this is a very, um, he's down with this model. Not all teachers are as much, but most of them get there over the year when they realize they get to do something different than they do in all their other classes. Um, and so just to conclude, um, just a simple summary with a final question. Um, so. This is, I think, the third time in my career I've sort of used ethnographic studies to inform the design of a new learning tool or learning. Um, and it's not an idea that's mine alone. I learned it when I was a graduate student at Berkeley, um, working at a research institute in Palo Alto, where, as many of you might know, there's, um, you might know the name Lucy Suchman. I had the opportunity to work with her a little bit. She used ethnographic studies um, to study people interacting with smart copy machines and use that to inform design. So I, th I think it's a very fruitful paradigm 
to start with ethnography somewhat indifferently and then leverage it to design. Um, the one thing I'd want to say here is that because some of us we work, but a lot of people tend to focus on the individual, I'd make an appeal that we should really be thinking about what the properties of environments are that produce playfulness, not so much whether a person has this or that disposition towards it, because I think that's fruitful. And then the final question, um, just not for now necessarily, I'm happy to hear people's thoughts on this or take any questions, but I'm really interested in what people think, given that you've seen the one study we did about gaming and play, what do you think would be other fruitful study context of play and learning to study in? And that's something I, I came here, you know, excited to talk to people about. So with that, I will conclude. Um, this, this is the five people who've been most instrumental. This um, is Jake, or Jaco Hilpo. Um, and I told him, I asked him for a picture over email yesterday. And um, when he sent me this one, I said, you realize, Jake, you're going to be the only one who's crooked. And he said, well, tell tell them I'm finished, the Danes will understand. <laughs> so with that, I, I thank you. <laughs>